Kuki, welcome back, mate. It's uh, like so much going on. Like uh, it's brain damage stuff. Like it's <laughs> tighten, easing, do nothing. You know, banks falling, getting into trouble. You know, oh, we got to stop. We're breaking the system. You know, Chris Joy's they'll they'll tighten till they break it. Um, you know, yeah. that's 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 his thesis. You know, and uh, question is, have they broken it? And then that's the question at the end of the day. So, and today's papers, you know, US Fed's going up. You know, ECB went up a couple of weeks ago, a week or so ago. You know, the, the Bank of England's put them up again. Yep. And of course, are we going to go up? That's the question. So let's just let's just let's talk about the noise first. So yes. why, why don't you tell me what does the noise mean? The noise. Uh, which is not the hard economic data. The not, noise not, is the banking problems yeah, yeah. Uh, and the perception that that could be a bigger issue for the global economy, not just in the US or with Credit Suisse in, in Europe and Switzerland. Obviously, we want our banks and financial institutions to be soundly based. They are actually the gearbox of the whole economy. And when we get sand in the gearbox, stalls, breaks down, we have a recession like we did during the global crisis. That was a classic case of the global financial banking crisis. Which is something they want to avoid. They want to avoid that because it leads to recession, high unemployment, business failures, and nobody wants that. So when we started getting that, um, uh, the banking issues emerging in the US, there was this, oh, what's it mean? Is it just a relatively isolated instance uh, confined to a couple of banks who were frankly poorly managed or was it something that was like permeating through the whole banking sector and now as we sit here now it appears to be just badly managed small regional banks or relatively small regional banks for the US they were poorly managed they didn't manage their asset and liability match so when they bought all these bonds with very low yields and they had to sell them as yields went up they realized losses as people withdrew their money, it was only because. And they it was only be, but Steve, it was only because there was a run on them. C- C- if, correct. If, yes. if, if they had just been normal day to day operations, they wouldn't have had to sell these bonds for a lower value. Correct. And they could have hedged them. And the good thing about how a lot of the uh, bank treasuries function in Australia and other banks around the US and, and the world, for that matter, is that they hedge these risks. They hedge yeah, the that, interest rate The interest risk. rate risk. Yeah, everybody knows that. Well, we know that rates have been going up for a, about a year or so now. And the prudent treasuries within the banks would be managing that risk. Now, sometimes they take a bit of a haircut. They lose a bit of money because they did buy the low-yielding bonds and as they hedge it, it does cost them some money. Yes, but it doesn't – it means they don't fail like the uh, Silicon Valley Bank. So just just stop there for one second if you don't mind. So it would sort of mean from my point of view at least the decision – they knew that they should be hedging but the decision not to hedge sometimes is a P&L – Issue. In other words, the cost of the hedge in the yes. middle of a rate rise period where rates are going up at faster speed than we've ever seen before, um, which is what has been happening, then therefore the cost of the hedge is crazy and in to some extent the cost of the hedge is prohibitive and it makes them look really bad. And so they, they lose money so and they don't their, share, the, their shareholders get very cross with correct. you. Correct. Yes. Yes. But, but, but the good thing is about it is no one loses any money. They just get pissed off. Yeah, and you have 12 months of pain yeah, yeah. until the next interest rate cycle turns down, whenever that may be. We'll talk about that a bit later if yeah, you wish. Yeah. But, you know, so it's really just managing like any person with debt, like a mortgage holder, like a business holder with an overdraft. This rate hiking cycle means that everybody who's got a loan, who's got debt, is paying more than they did a year ago. Um, it's a similar thing for these banks in the US that didn't, Hedge, hedge in- against that risk. They didn't prepare for this risk and they got caught out and they got burnt and, uh, yeah, and and when that happened, of course, the immediate reaction of financial markets is to think, oh, my goodness, is this systemic? Systemic. Yeah. And Everybody's the, got the same problem. Correct. Is everybody got this problem and, you know, there's a, a lot of kerfuffle. You know, I'm spent over half my nights awake watching this equity market, the US stock market, bouncing up and down massively. It appears, though, that it's not systemic. It appears confined to a few players. And we've heard from the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury, Janet Yellen. They're going to, I won't say bail out the banks because they're not going to do that, but they're looking at the issue, ensuring that the banks get their act together and that there's no 
duplicate of what happened to those uh, other two banks. In other words, you got to go knock on everyone's door and say, you know, yep. show us your position yep. uh, and we'll tell you what you got to do. Be, fu- be bushfire ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah correct. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and sort of a similar sort of thing happened in Europe with the Swiss government that sort of stepped in and, you know, put up a facility for the you know, the, the bank, but now they've, yeah. uh, for Credit Suisse, but now they've arranged for it to be bought by uh, another bank, you know, uh, in, in the U- UBS, which is a United Bank of Switzerland, which is yep. a bigger bank. And they'll probably sort all that stuff out. And it doesn't seem like there's been any more fallout, relatively speaking. Otherwise, we would have heard about it by now. So in terms of the noise, we all thought one week ago, because of all this stuff's going on, the Reserve Bank's not going to put the rates up again because they're going to sit back and wait and see what happens. Yep. And, and because there is a thesis out there, and you know as well as anybody, it's sort of, sort of proof as to the way everyone's reacting the reserve banks of around the world, their equivalents, are basically take the view, we'll keep tightening, we'll keep putting rates up until we break something. Yes. Well, we'll put it this way. When we break something, well, we've got to stop. Co- correct. We'll keep putting rates up because we still have this, even though inflation's coming down quite nicely, it's not as rapidly as most central banks would like. They'd like it to get back to the target range sooner. And because it's taking a little longer than perhaps they would have thought six months ago, they're still hiking. And as you said, they'll hike and hike. You know, it's a bit like the um, you know, the boiling frog analogy. You keep turning up the water, the frog's in cold water, you turn up the water, oh, it doesn't matter. Then finally it jumps out. Yeah. And I think the bank's problems that we just identified is that I won't say a breaking point because it's only a few banks that have been broken. It's not the whole economy. Correct. But nonetheless, people are looking at what's happening and then taking a step back, looking at the hard data on the economy too and seeing there's a slowdown happening. So we haven't really broken what they want to break. What they really want to break though is people spending money. And and, yes. and vendors putting prices up, which is creating inflation. Correct. So, That's and it in so, a nutshell. So yeah. we haven't we haven't they haven't broken the right thing. So yeah. I think personally, right now, the noise is just noise around banks get going getting into trouble. I don't think it's enough at this stage for our RBA to not increase rates. They may not increase rates, but the noise is not enough for them to not increase rates. That's my, my position. If the data tells them to increase rates, he made it pretty clear in the last statement yeah. that if he needs to, he will. Yes, they've got a bias to hike yeah. if the data in demands the it. And, okay, if there's a major financial crisis between now and the next board meeting and the one after that, yeah. of course, that's all all bets off when if you have a major crisis. But at the moment, as you said, I think it's just, noise, it's very loud yeah. and it gets amplified because, oh, there's a bank that went bust, you know, or something well, like that. Well, Credit Suisse is a big name. And, so. and Credit Suisse is a huge name in, in Europe. So it does get amplified but then when you sort of take a step back and while well, bank share prices have come off a bit, there's a little bit of nervousness, they haven't gone into free fall. If you look at our banks and our on the ASX, yeah, they're down 10-odd percent but they're not down 30 40%, which they were during the global financial crisis, you know, a little over a decade ago. So... We can now we can I think we can move past the noise, Steve, yep. because I think that I think that's all it is. It's it's noise, and you know we're all still a bit bruised from the GFC. We know what a global financial crisis looks like, yep. etc. Um, we don't want to go down that track again. But what's interesting this time around is governments around the world move very quickly compared to what they did in two thousand and eight. Like they, they didn't move in to, to protect anyone. This Correct. time they just and, jumped and, all over and it. The uh, Problem spread and kept spreading and kept spreading and then finally they came in but it was too late. Now, instantly, as soon as we heard of this uh, Silicon Valley bank having problems, that afternoon, it was a Friday in the US a couple of weeks ago, that afternoon we heard all of the Fed and Treasury officials in the US coming out talking. That weekend they met and worked out what on earth they would do. They put in contingency plans and guaranteed bank deposits and these sorts of things. They just reiterated it, if nothing else. And so when the markets opened on the Monday morning, oh, okay, there's a concern, but it's not it's not Armageddon. Yeah, right. So so what is the data telling us for the next meeting of the RBA? So yeah. what do you what do you what has there been any data releases that you think are of significance that we should be leaning into? Well, as you touched on, uh, the RBA governor at the last meeting highlighted a number of items that he and the board will be looking at, the labour market, unemployment, and we did see a nice 
Rebound in employment last month, plus 60,000. Unemployment went back down to 3.5%. So the labour market numbers were strong. Uh, we haven't had a lot of information on uh, new inflation. We get another monthly inflation reading, unfortunately, next week. So we'll find out a little bit more information then. But around the world, inflation, as we we're saying, has come down. Because he but didn't not say that. He, he was interested in global inflation. He, he is. He mentioned correct. three things. He said the unemployment number. Wage price pressures, correct, and global inflation. He didn't say he didn't say our inflation. He said global, global inflation because we What's import inflation. Well, look, Australia's uh, an open trading country. You know, the oil price, the price that you and I pay for our petrol, is not determined by we in Australia. It's the the interplay of what's happening in the Middle East, driving in the US, passenger transport uh, systems around the world. It's driven by the global economy. Things like uh, that fed into the very high cost of construction, particularly for housing. Lumber, wood, steel and these sorts of things was very high. That was why inflation went up so high last year. They want them to come down. So the global inflation story will be one that we import, if you like. So if the oil price keeps coming down, and by the way, it's down quite a lot, which is good news for the inflation story, we know that lumber prices are down, copper prices are down, all these commodities which go into the production process that are Part of the reason why inflation went up and one reason why inflation's going down, the $64 question right now is, is inflation gently going down and it will take a long time to get there or is it falling sharply and say that in oh, six or nine months we'll be pleasantly surprised about how quickly inflation fell. The jury is out on that but as Dr Lowe and the RBA is saying, um, these global inflation pressures are encouraging it's like the first couple of baby steps that you take along the path. They're encouraging, but we're not quite there yet. Right. So so in terms of data that's been released, we, we haven't had our our inflation update, our no, CPI update yet. in Australia, one. Um, we did get an update on unemployment. Or that's that's come back down to 3.5, which is not a good thing. And then in terms of wage price pressures or wage pressures or, or inflation driven by wages going up at a rate, at a clip that is yep. not healthy for us. Where are we at with that? Yeah, well, we actually, we've got two bits of information. One is the official wage price index for the December quarter, which came out recently. Which was okay. Which was a low result. Mm. Uh, well, it's 3.3% annual increase. The Reserve Bank were forecasting 35 And with our unemployment rate so low, you might think, gee, wages are going to be booming. They're not. They're increasing and they're sort of like in this – uh, Goldilocks area, not too hot, not too cold. They're about right, to be frank, in terms of your macro economy. 3.5% or so for wages is pretty good, but 33 that's a little bit lower. And one other data point which I'm increasingly looking at, Seek, the job yep. advertising company, they look at the average salaries in all those thousands and thousands of ads they have on, the, on their webpage. And they're actually showing that the asking or the advertised wages is slowing down. You mean dropping off a bit? Dropping down. It did pick up through the course of last year. And on their measure, their measure is very different to the Bureau of Stats, yeah. of course. But their measure went from about uh, 2.5% to about 4%. It's now just come back to about 3 and 3 quarter percent. It's a very different measure. But nonetheless, it's more the turning points and direction. Yeah. So if people it's more are, the change. At, it's a change rather yeah. than the number because of the compositional shifts. So if the if the wages that people are advertising vacancies is growing less rapidly, that says to me that once we start getting data for what where are we March quarter, twenty twenty three, it'll show a further moderation in the official wages numbers. So from the RBA's perspective, that fear of a wage price spiral, which was something that the RBA governor well was a little concerned about, isn't happening in the wage data that we've seen. At the moment. At the moment, He correct. specifically called it out in the last meeting. So he did, yes. So one of the three things he's going to be looking at. Um, and he did say we remain resolute. He did that indeed. That was his words. Yep. Resolute and getting us back down to 2 to 3% in the medium term, I think he said. Yes. Not the long term. So I think we should go through your famous whiteboard. <laughs> yes. The, the monetary policy uh, checklist, which uh, yeah. helps to explain some of the stuff that we've been talking about plus a few extra but things. But put it into context. Into context and you can see quite graphically what we're yeah. talking about. So j just before yeah. we get into your uh, 
famous whiteboard. <laughs> Just explain what the markets mean by the terminal rate of the official rate, the terminal rate of interest yep. as an official rate. A phrase that we economists and particularly market economists use is the terminal rate for official interest rates. That's the maximum rate that the economy can stand effectively. So in simple terms, it's the peak in where market economists judge to be sufficient to get the economy to slow down, to get inflation back to the target. So the terminal rate is effectively what's the sort of rate that'll get inflation back on track. And it's the, it's the rate also that market analysts use to build models out too. So you've got to have a terminal rate in terms of doing your modelling. Yes. And that's the, generally speaking, the generally accepted rate that everybody accepts. And what is it right now? We're 3.6 yeah. official rates, so where is yep. the terminal rate? It's around about 3.85%. Without being to the to the decimal point, yeah. it's it's a little bit higher than where we are, yeah. but not much higher than where we are. Right. So, uh, and, of course, the other thing about the terminal rate, Mark, is that it, it can change as yeah. events change. Well, it has changed. It's come back. Indeed. It's come well, back. It was for 20 or 10 or something, like about cor- three months ago. Correct. And it changes as we get a little bit of extra news. But at yeah. the moment, we're currently around that 3.85%, which is a effectively one more 25-point hike is in the minds of most market economists. Yeah, right, So, which doesn't mean there's going to be a 25 base point rate change next month in April, but it means they, they expect over a period of time before rates stop moving, it could go another 0.25. It's, yes. it, could, it could be June, it, could, it might be July. Could, it could go another 0.25, but it's not going to be going 0.75 or 1 yeah, percentage yeah. point. Yeah. I think we've scaled back from that. Yeah. Uh, 0.25, and in, interestingly, just in this last, well, couple of weeks, partly because of the banking crisis, but also because a lot of the global lower inflation numbers that we were chatting about a minute ago are actually feeding into assessments of what more the RBA needs to, go, to do to get inflation back on track. Right, let's go. Okay, the monetary policy checklist. And as those of you who have been watching it in the past, It's a range of economic indicators and it's using the hard data to see whether they influence the Reserve Bank to tightening, neutral or easing. So GDP. Can I just say, just before you do, because the Reserve Bank's only interested in the hard data. They're not not interested in what the – it's on the front page of the Fin Review or anything. (laughs) I'm sure they read it. Yeah, but then (laughs) that that shouldn't make it. The hard data – and the hard data is you're talking about modelling in terms of the terminal rate. Yeah. Each time we get an extra GDP number, each time we get an extra jobs number, that feeds into their models. The hard data on what unemployment was is the critical thing. And if I can just spend 30 seconds on, and and I'm not bringing this up to be critical of Dr Lowe, the RBA governor, but when he said that he expected rates to not not be hiked until 2024, he was looking at the hard data on the economy, which was weak, with inflation below the target and he couldn't see the time when inflation would pick up. And that's not having a go at him, but it was what the data was telling him. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. So the hard data on GDP, we know that in the last three quarters, GDP has slowed from 0.9 to 0.7 to 0.5. GDP is slowing, so that's in the neutral camp. Don't need to hike, don't need to cut. So just, just on that, 0.5. 0.5 is the last quarterly That's growth quarterly. in GDP. It indicates an annual run rate of what? It's 2.7 was yep. the run rate. Yep. Uh, we're talking about trend GDP. That's about the sort of, again, the Goldilocks. If we could grow the economy at 2.7% every year for the next 10 years, we'd be happy. But, of course, there's a cycle. Yeah. So it's a good result. That's why it's neutral. You don't need a hike to get it slower. You don't need to ease to get it stronger. So it's it's in the neutral camp. Yep. Inflation. Yeah, that's our bugbear. Yep. As we're saying, inflation's high, high around the world. Even though it's coming down, it's still way above the target. So the the last quarterly inflation read was what, Steve? Well, 7.8 was the quarterly read. That's for the The December quarter. The monthly read, which was for January, is down to 7.4. So it's moving in the right direction. Remember, critically, absolutely critically, the target for the RBA is between two and three. Here we are talking sevens. Yeah. We've got a long way to go. Yeah. Labor market, I'm going to put that into, well, between neutral and tightening because unemployment's very low and even though we just discussed the wages side not being an issue, there's still a risk that if the unemployment rate stays at this very low level that we'll get some wage pressures. So that's sort of in between neutral and tightening. Actual wages, as we just discussed, neutral. You don't hike or cut because of that. International economy, I'm going to put that into easing. 
the world economy is very weak right now. Uh, the chatter about the US, Europe is recession, recession, recession. Whether we get there or not, it's in a sense doesn't matter what label you put on it, growth's going to be very weak. So but the UK government, the UK um, Chancellor of Exchequer said they don't expect there to be a recession in the UK as late as yesterday. Yep. Um, but are you worried about more about Europe and US? Europe, US, and even China, with its reopening from COVID a uh, couple of months ago, hasn't really had that, you know, uplift that we wanted to. You know, they're a major trading partner. Yep. We want China to be strong, so they buy lots of our iron ore and all of our other products. So, but the international economy is pretty weak and right. weakening. Right. And remember that, you know, just as we in Australia are experiencing the impact of these rate hikes, so too are people in America, in Europe, in the UK. Except you might just touch on just quickly on that because sure. that's an important point you just raised. It is. The US is largely a fixed rate economy and the speed at which Correct. rate increases affect the US is much slower than what happens here in Australia. Indeed. Most of the mortgages there are fixed rates and long-dated fixed rates. They're 30-year mm. mortgages. Can you believe it? Um, whereas here in Australia, we're predominantly variable with our, our fixed rates generally only being two or three years. And that's, of course, this mortgage uh, cliff issue that's yep. that's unfolding before our eyes at, as we speak. So that, that is a big, big difference for us relative to the rest of the world. So, And that's another reason why we don't have to hike. Well, another reason why we probably don't have to hike as much as the rest of the world. Yep. The RBA hikes, well, 350 basis points. That impacts mortgage holders very quickly. The Fed hikes... 500 basis points, it trickles into the mortgage system slowly. So, so uh, only for usually for new borrowers. For new borrowers, yes. So they have to do a whole lot more to achieve the same result as our friends down at yeah, Martin Place. We're, we're sort of lucky bank. in that regard. Correct. Variables are good. The predominance of variables are a good thing in Australia. It makes monetary policy work a little better. Yes. House prices, I'm going to put that as neutral. Core logic have got house prices lifting in the month of March. Whether that's just a noisy blip, I don't know, but the RBA would be, neither be happy nor sad with that. They've already come off nine odd percent um, house prices, so that would be neutral. Retail sales, weak. We know that the volumes in the December quarter were down. The I was looking at, uh, I think it was ANZ, they look at their credit card and uh, transfer payments to the retail sector. It looks like that in March, it's going to be a big negative. We consumers, we're not silly. We're responding to higher interest costs. We're responding to cost of living. We're spending less. We're sitting at home, having cooking at home rather than going out for dinner. <laughs> sort of thing. And, the and by the way, the next point, the bullet point, will probably tell us the reason and why. this is the reason. Consumer sentiment, my goodness. We had both ANZ and Westpac releasing their consumer sentiment numbers recently. Both are near historical lows. And the other thing, Mark, which I find really hard to believe, but it, it's a fact, consumer sentiment today is worse than at the worst point during the COVID lockdowns. So when we were locked down wow. a couple of years ago, you know, businesses were shut, you know, we were stuck at home, worried about the health. You know, that was a scary time, I have to admit. Consumer sentiment obviously fell. Now it's weaker, which goes to show to me anyway that cost of living, interest rate hikes, uncertainty about, well, we've got house prices, you know, I've lost some wealth. You know, the stock market's pretty pretty poor at the moment. You know, people just don't have that confidence. I don't feel that rich. There's a cash flow effect. So consumer sentiment, is it a good time to buy a household item? No. Consumer sentiment's very weak. Building approvals. Again, I saw the numbers come out uh, a couple of weeks ago. No one's building anymore. House building approvals have fallen. You know, building companies are going belly up. Not all over the place, but frequently enough. Well, there's it's, it's, the cost it's a massive pressures, increase of building um, uh, bankruptcies big, in the last. Correct, because the fixed rate contracts have seen them be underwater. Because as I was saying, yeah, the cost of lumber and steel, let alone getting a tradie to sort of put the electrician and the plumbing and all that sort of stuff. So building approvals are weak. Ah, good news is business investments. Yeah, and were I strong. don't understand oh, this one. Well, and it came through the NAB survey just recently. Yeah. The business sector. Is downright optimistic about the economy. I don't. I just don't. I mean, so consumers are gloomy as yeah. can be. The business sector. Look, I think. How do you reconcile those two? Things? I, I think I reconcile the business sector with the links to our mining sector. You know, iron ore is still one hundred and twenty-five dollars US a ton, uh, and even though you know you and I don't export iron ore, the spin-offs into the companies that manage 
the cash flow, that manage the workers, that manage the machinery and equipment that's needed. Bill that, Evans is called it the prosperity dividend. Correct. And so that actually has an impact on on the business sector. And the so I, I suspect it's linked to the export sector doing pretty well. Uh, and I think there's also this... Uh, what do we call it, a hangover from COVID. During COVID, a lot of businesses shelved their projects to, you know, ramp up their IT spend or to build another warehouse or whatever. Well, they couldn't do it. We were all locked down or they couldn't actually get the machinery. So when businesses are now saying, now that we're living with COVID, they're saying, well, gee, I actually do need that IT equipment. I need to build that warehouse because I'm selling more stuff um, through the warehouse rather than bricks and mortar retail. So the business sector's doing pretty well. We consumers are the ones that are getting hit with these interest rate hikes. And that feeds into the business confidence, which is nice and strong. Commodity prices, they're neutral. You know, they're down a bit from where they were six months ago. But as I said, iron ore is high. Yeah, you know, oil price is down, which is good for inflation. But, you know, the RBA is not going to be putting up rates or down rates because of commodity prices. Stock market's weak. Again, I'll put that just between easing and neutral because the stock market's down on the back of the banking concerns and rate hikes and the like. And current rates, well... well gonna, just on the stock market, what, what's interesting yep. about that, before you go into current rates, yep. Steve, is, is that um, in aggregate, the, what we've got to remember is the contribution of what banks contribute to the total ASX, oh. all ordinaries index, <laughs> is quite significant. Yes. Um, so there are some people in the stock market who are killing it. Like they might have a lithium mine or something like that. <laughs> yes, They're doing exactly, very well, yeah. um, but then but the banks dominate in our stock market at least uh, such a big percentage of the total. Co- correct, and the fact that as we we're saying before, the bank stocks in Australia, while well, they're down about ten percent roughly because of just a bit of market sentiment about what's happening. But there's in the also US. margin shrinking too. Because, uh, indeed, the rate hike because they're all going to pay back economy. this uh, the TFF. TFF. Yeah, yeah they're, they're going to pay it back. Correct. And now they're raising money at six and a half percent instead all of sort. point one. <laughs> yeah, yes. correct. Ouch. Yeah. So their 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 margins are <laughs> yeah. contracting. Correct. And uh, and all the analysts are telling everyone about it. So the the time to have, have uh, owned a bank stock and sold a bank stock was last year when they were correct. making ridiculous profits. Making. Fat margins. Yeah, yeah. now it's the t- maybe it's the time to consider buying. Not that we're advising anybody, but um, yeah. So s- stocks is yeah, it's not we. It's in here, it's but in here, we but shouldn't give too much weight not, to it. it. Again, these are not equal weighting. You know, the higher higher up the board you are, the more importance it is to the RBA. Down the bottom, a bit less importance. So current rates, I'll put that in the uh, neutral column. We've already had three hundred and fifty points of rate hikes. As we were discussing, we're near the terminal rate. Uh, we do, yeah, it's not a slam dunk that we're going to get more rate hikes. It's it's a debatable thing, and this is the grey area that our friends at the Reserve Bank will be considering at their board meeting. Uh, you know, have we done enough? That's the sixty four dollar question, or do we need just one more? You know, do we need another spoonful of sugar to make it <laughs> to make it sweet enough, or have we already got enough in there? So, so just on this though, like inflation. So inflation is the one that's really worrying them. C- correct, and that's, that's where the most of the that weight should is. have a, a bright light. Yeah. Over the inflation. So, where do you think? What do you think they're going to do? I think they're on hold. I, I think that the numbers on balance are suggesting that they probably don't need to do a lot more yet. So, and and one of the things that I've learned looking at the RBA over, gosh, thirty something years, uh, is that even if they pause in, let's just say they pause April, May, June, just just for argument's sake, and then we do find in July, gee. Unemployment's fallen more. Oh, we actually do have a wage issue and that inflation deceleration hasn't been all that significant. They can hike again. You know, it's very – what we've actually seen this last 12 months is very rare. Hiking 10 meetings in a row, well, it's never happened before. If you look back at history on both cuts and hikes, they often do two hikes, sit back for three months, do another couple of hikes, sit back for a couple of months, do another one and – that's how they generally have managed monetary policy in the past. And I think it would be prudent just to take a step back. You know, there's a lot in the pipeline and some of these indicators are weak. Now, they genuinely are weak. So do you need to do one more uh, to achieve your inflation target or let's just take a time out, have a cup of tea, come back in a month's time, have a look how the data's gone. And if the data's weakened, Fine, they don't do anything. If the data is still resilient, okay, we'll do another one in May, June, July. So, right. how do you reconcile that though with what's happened in the US? So, for example, yep. you know, and 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 end of the UK. So, yep. 
they're in sort of similar sorts of situations. Yeah, so yeah, similar. Well, why why do you think they didn't say let's just wait and see? Yeah. And, and, or, can I, can I, and, and how much of the fact that the US is largely a fixed rate market? So in other words, their rate rises haven't affected that many people relative to what our rate rises have affected. Like 60% of our market at the moment is variable rate. So yep. how much of that do you think flows into your your, your recommendation? Yeah, and I think it's because they – and Should we copy the US is what everyone's saying? Broadly in direction but not in magnitude I think is how I'd answer that question. You know, if the, if the US Fed's hiking interest rates, it's because there's a, an issue going on that we will feel through the global commodity price cycle, for example. But it doesn't mean we have to go lockstep. They go 25, we go 25. And we haven't. You know, since the start of this hiking cycle a little over a year ago for the US, yeah, they've gone almost 500 points. We've only gone 350. So we haven't even matched them one for one. And that's because of the variable rates bias, I suppose we call it in Australia, is because the structure of our economy is very different. We've got a lot more mining than the US. The relatively US, speaking. Relative, the, the relative US, to our total GDP. Relative to GDP. So yep. in a sense, that changes our growth potential. And we're talking about potential GDP in Australia being about 2.75. In the US, it's only about 2%. They just don't grow as quickly as we do because we can just dig a lot of, a lot of stuff out of the ground. And that adds to our growth momentum. Uh, the other thing too, I think, is that US is very much a, a tech type economy. And for every, you know, Microsoft or Facebook or Apple, there's about a thousand companies that go bust. You know, the, the backyard person who does this wonderful thing doesn't work, fine. They're entrepreneurial. Not, I'm not saying Australians aren't entrepreneurial, but, you know, there's a slightly different composition to how their economy functions. And that feeds into the Fed decisions too. So um, at the end of the day, the US had a higher inflation peak, wages growth was stronger than here. That's another reason why they probably did more than we're going to be seeing here in Australia. So you're saying no uh, 25 base point increase in the next meeting in, in April? Correct. But you're not saying that there won't be any more after that. You are saying it's, that <laughs> they'll, yeah. they'll stop and have a look because we're still going to see this mortgage cliff, so-called fixed rate cliff uh, occur. We don't know what the outcome of that's going to be. And by as opposed to the US, everyone stays on fixed rate mortgages forever. Here, they're not only they 6% of our market is variable, but not only that, the 40% yep. that is on fixed rates is going to come off soon. Very, very soon. And it go to variables. Already. Correct. At three, 400 basis points. More. More than they took out that mortgage 18 months, two years ago. And that's, so, so you, you never you never rule it out, but I think they're going to be, the Reserve Bank will be on hold. They'll see what happens. And look, in my view, I don't think they're going to hike again in this cycle. I think we're in for a 12 month period of rates on hold and they'll see what happens. But if there is a move in the next three months, it'll be up, not down. I don't yep. think, we're, we're still nowhere near cutting yet, gosh. Yeah, um, I know the mark, some people in the markets are thinking rate cuts to me, as in the near term. I can understand it for 2024, not in 2023. No. Uh, so I think more rates on hold, and if there is a move, it'll be up, and that will be driven by the Reserve Bank saying, oh, that inflation rate, while it fell, it didn't fall as much as we wanted it to. Maybe we need just one more to squeeze that inflation rate back to the target a little more quickly. I reckon we'll, I reckon we'll and it's, it's not based on any data, I just think he'll go one more just to slam it home. Right. But then yep. he won't do any more. And you're saying he probably won't go, he's just going to have wait and see. He could go later, but, but, but definitely one thing is we are in agreement with here is we're at the end of the of the tightening phase and like whether there's one more in it now one minute in a couple of months or whatever we at the end of it Co correct things we're, are starting to the, break things are starting to break and again you just have to look at uh yeah the consumer sentiment and consumer spending and remembering that consumer spending makes up 55 percent of gdp yeah. you know w what you and i spend and everybody spends on their food groceries insurance policies newspapers books kids holidays kids, school fees, rent, all that sort of stuff. That's 55% of GDP. And we are paring back our expenditure. We're not, we're, we're buying cheaper goods. You know, so we're switching from, you know, maybe the fillet steak to the mince and having spag bowl rather than a, a fillet steak on the barbie or something like that. So We're not going uh, out as much, put it that way. We're not going out and we're just changing where we spend. Holidays down the south coast rather than to... 
Bali or Europe. You know? yeah. so, so in a sense, and that is less spending. It is a weaker economy. So it's a really interesting phenomenon. And what, what's interesting about that, and we'll finish off with this, but like, what's interesting is I've even seen airlines now putting out much reduced prices for airline travel, at least domestically. You know, it's, it's quite oh, interesting. What, Mark, you've hit a, something that I'm watching really closely. There's one of these companies that does look at daily airfares, you know, because of course they change all the time. One of the things that caused that 7.8% inflation in the December quarter, one yep. of the key drivers was airfares and, and domestic travel, travel yep. domestic and international travel. The airfares have dropped about 25% yeah, from February. From, C- correct. Like, like so literally like from February. On your CPI number, plus uh, the fact that petrol's down a little bit, not, not as much as the global oil prices suggest. So maybe we'll get lower oil prices in April, May. But if these couple of things just come through, not only do they add zero to inflation, actually a negative. They clip, you know, half a percent off of your inflation rate. So you, you very quickly go from 7.8 to 6.8 to 4.8 if you get these things continuing. So again, early days, but the Reserve Bank will be seeing exactly this thing. So lower airfares and these sorts of things will feed into lower inflation. Kooky, great to talk to you again, mate. Let's, I'm, I'm sitting back to wait to see which one we get. Oh, it, the April board meeting will be a corker. Every, all eyes on, oh, uh, yeah. on the RBA website. Big time. Thanks, mate. <laughs>